All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it is 7.30 now, so I will go ahead and get things started here. Um, for those of you who don't know me or we haven't met yet, um, I'm Dr. Joel Phillips, um, Associate Program Director with the, uh, with the Fellowship, but um, also the Medical Director for Trinity Health Grand Rapids Palliative Care. Clinically, I do most of my work in the um, neurology sector, um, doing neuropalliative care. So a few of you will um, have the opportunity through the year to rotate over there as well and see how that works. Um, this lecture itself really stems from my own fellowship and my interest in buprenorphine as an alternative medication. Um, so a lot of this research was done early on there and I've kind of modified the lecture through the years. So as we talk through this, um, if there's any questions, feel free to um, interrupt along the way. Um, I am not sure I'm gonna have a good view of the chat as we go along. So um, go right ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions along the way. So I am gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, the objectives today really are to understand buprenorphine itself and Part of how we use it now and why we use it the way we do does depend on the history or kind of its context there. So I want to briefly go over some of its history, uh, but then really explain more of the pharmacology and safety and then um, go through some dosing and then some other scenarios you'll run into on the floors as you're going about your um, palliative care rotations. So what exactly is buprenorphine? Um, the best way to think of it as it's a semi-synthetic um, medication um, derived from the poppy, which we'll see in a couple of minutes. Um, you'll hear the term antagonist, antagonist, and that can be quite confusing because people talk about it being an opiate receptor agonist, antagonist, um, but we'll dive into that. Um, the original intent was to be a non-addictive analgesic that would be long acting. Um, it does not come in oral forms. So it comes transdermal, sublingual, buccal, um, IM and IV, but the bioavailability is so poor orally that um, it does limit how we're actually giving the medication. Um, one thing I really want you to remember from this lecture is that this is a schedule three medication. So unlike your opiates, which are schedule two and require more monitoring, this is still controlled, but it's more on the scale of a benzodiazepine um, when you put it into context. So that actually allows it for, for um, ease of prescription um, through, through this whole system. So let's get into the history a little bit and then we'll, um, dive into the pharmacology. So this originally came out of 40 years of research looking for non-addictive analgesics. So it started back in the 1920s, but it wasn't until 1966 when John Lewis, as a doctoral student, um, actually discovered this. Um, there were two un unsuccessful synthetic opiates before this. Um, and actually, interesting thing here is John Lewis actually tried the medication on himself um, as part of those phase one trials. In the 70s, it was studied as a possible addiction drug um, because it had the agonistic and antagonistic properties. In 1978, it was approved for analgesic purposes in the United Kingdom. And by the 1980s, 50% of the prescriptions in France were actually being diverted and off-label for addiction medicine. So very quickly, people learned that this was a great medicine for addiction. Um, that being said, the focus of today is really going to be more on the palliative care aspect, the pain management aspect, and not so much of addiction medicine. Um, there will be a great series coming up later on in the year where we dive more into addiction medicine. So um, think of it more from the analgesic perspective today. Again, it's semi-synthetic, um, derived from the poppy. Um, it's a full and partial agonist of the mu opioid receptor. Um, where it's an antagonist is at the kappa receptor. Um, so keep that in mind. It, ag it agonizes mu, but antagonizes kappa. So both opioid receptors, but that's why we get that um, agonist antagonist effect from it. Um, high potency. So this medication um, binds to the receptors. It'll actually 
displace other re other um, U agonists like morphine, Dilaudid. Um, it's gonna because of that potency. It's gonna it has the potential to knock um, those agonists off the receptor. However, keep in mind there's a receptor reserve. So only a about 50% or even less of the receptors are occupied by buprenorphine. So that leaves at least 50% of the receptors that are still open. Uh, so we can use this with other opioid, ang or opioid agonists. So yes, it's potent. Yes, it knocks off the other agonists, but there's plenty of other receptors around for those new agonists to, to bind to. It's got a slow off rate because it's, um, such high potency, um, it's going to dissociate from the receptor much slower. And you'll see that with the half-lives as we talk pharmacology. Interestingly, it is a chaperone ligand as well. What that means is that as it binds the receptor, it induces more op mu opioid receptor expression on the cell. So that may be part of why we've got that receptor reserve or why we only have that 50% uh, occupancy rate. On the kappa receptor, um, it is that antagonist that we talked about. Um, what we believe this does is it reduces tolerance, um, but also has some antidepressant effects. So if pain is affecting mood, this may be a good thing to consider. Um, it can kind of boost, boost spirits a little bit along the way. Uh, one receptor that doesn't get talked about very often, and I think is probably carrying a lot of um, um, probably deserves a little bit more attention and is doing a lot more than what we think it is, is the ORL1 receptor. Uh, so this can be seen in the dorsal horn um, as all that sensory input is coming into the spinal cord, um, but it also can be seen in the brain. So at the dorsal horn, this receptor is thought to be analgesic. So cutting down on that pain signal that's coming into the brain or into the spinal cord and traveling up the brain. Um, in the brain, the receptor, when triggered, inhibits the anti section. So I know that's a double, double negative, but a good way of thinking it, about it is that this receptor in the brain, you feel the pain, and it allows you to feel the pain. Um, and it's thought to dampen the brain reward system. So we think uh, what, what we're seeing is we're probably getting an analgesic effect at that dorsal horn. But in the brain, we're dampening that reward system. So we're, we're developing less tolerance and less reward. So keep that receptor in mind. I think that that's one that um, no, none of the other medications that I'm aware of is, is really um, attacking or affecting. Um, so just to review, it's a very complicated slide. It actually took me quite some time myself as I began reviewing this to really understand what's going on. But what I want you to pay most attention to really is the bottom here where you have mu or ORL1 and kappa. It's just rephrasing what we've already talked about. So the mu, we're talking primary analgesia. Um, there's no ceiling effect. We'll talk about that more in a second, but also reduced opioid dependence. With the ORL1, we're getting that secondary analgesic effect as well as that reduced reward system. And then finally, that kappa system, um, reduced tolerance, and again, that antidepressant effect. So when we talk about full and partial agonism, what does that truly mean? Um, I want you to take a look at this graph here. Um, that, that partial agonism is where we get more of a ceiling effect, where as we look at the dose increasing, and then we look at the effect of uh, certain given effects of the medication. Um, we see a ceiling effect where the higher the dose goes, we really don't get much further effect. That's really more of that partial agonism, where full agonism is where you get the, the, the higher the dose, the more effect you get um, from the medication. So when we look at the analgesic effect, we have that full agonism. So the higher dose, um, we're going to get more effect on the pain. Where we see the ceiling effect or that partial agonism is with the respiratory depression. So keep that in mind that, and this is more so for opiate tolerant patients, I would say, the higher dose you go, you're not going to get that respiratory depression. Now, if you were to give this medication to somebody who's opiate naive and you're doing high doses, you, you may well still see that um, depression. 
Um, but in, in theory, uh, we have that ceiling effect on that respiratory depression itself. When we look at the analgesic effect, um, this is looking more at sublingual dosing when we see these numbers in the milligrams here. Um, when we're looking at eight up, even up to that 32 milligrams where we're seeing that peak effect, this is the range where we're doing more of the, the um, addiction medicine uh, type dosing. It's really down in this range here, the analgesic dose range, um, 0.2 to less than seven milligrams um, really gives good effect. You can go higher, eight. Some people I do actually have on 16 milligrams, but usually you're going to get a, a good effect um, and you're going to see that rapid response to a higher dose at those lower doses. So let's look a little at the pharmacology. Um, so it's a lipophilic, which distributes well in the brain, and it's protein binding. Um, and it binds to the alpha and beta globulins, not to albumin. Um, so this does result in low plasma concentrations, but it's still circulating the system, and this contributes to the larger half-life as well. Um, in the liver, it can be metabolized into norbuprenorphine, um, but it can be glucuronidated as well to buprenorphine 3-glucuronide or norbuprenorphine 3-and um, we can actually see these metabolized drugs be um, higher than the, the, the parent drug concentrations. Uh, what's important about this is norbuprenorphine and buprenorphine 3-glucuronide are analgesic. Um, the norbuprenorphine 3-glucuronide is, or I'm sorry, the norbuprenorphine um, is what is thought to be um, causing some of the respiratory depression itself. Um, because it's, it, it is metabolized um, by CYP3A4, um, but it does not inhibit um, CYP itself. So there's fewer drug interactions. So um, you keep that in mind if you've got somebody with polypharmacy and you're worried about putting them on several different medications, there's few medications that truly interact with buprenorphine. Um, again, the CYP3A4 inhibitors don't influence the pharmacokinetics. Part of that is buprenorphine can be excreted unmetabolized as well. Um, but do be careful. Um, I, I know back here we're, we're saying that there's no inhibition, fewer drug interactions, but do keep in mind that with benzodiazepines or other CNS depressants, um, there may be some competition for those CYP uh, metabolites or CYP enzymes, um, even though there's no inhibition. So um, use caution with, with benzodiazepines. Um, I wanted to go over a few of the different routes and talk about kind of their bioavailability, um, peak onset and duration. This may be a good reference for later on, nothing that I expect you to memorize now, but gives you a good idea of what to expect. So with sublingual, um, this, this drug, when it comes in sublingual, it's dirt cheap, easy to get. Um, when we use it 15 to 60 minutes, we see that onset lasts for one to four hours. Um, for that peak, but can the duration may be up to six to 12 hours, even if you're doing higher doses, um, 24 to 72 hours. So this is something that if I'm dosing it for my patient, I typically do BID or TID dosing, um, and we, we do pretty well with that. Uh, the half-life, again, is 31 to 35 hours, um, but again, that bioavailability is, is pretty poor. Um, when we look at transdermal, um, there's a longer time to onset. So once you put the patch on, it's going to take 12 to 24 hours before you see effect. The 17 hours is really where you're going to see that peak. Um, Half-life, again, is about 26 hours. Bioavailability, again, is terrible at 15%. Um, transmucosally, um, this is probably my favorite way of administering it when I'm able to, when insurance covers it. It gives me a lot of flexibility. Um, my own experience uh, with my patients takes about 30 to 45 minutes. I couldn't find a number on this one exactly, which is why I'm sharing my own experience there. Um, peak duration is about three hours, um, or peak 
to therapeutic effect is three hours, duration is about eight to 12. Again, long half-life bioavailability is getting better at that 46 to 65%. And then again, IV um, or even intramuscular, I rarely see um, this medication used this way. No, it can be, um, but you know, practically speaking, it's, it's, it's um, not done very often. But again, just like any IV medication, 15 minutes and it works. Peak duration or time to peak is 12, two hours. And then that duration still is pretty long for an IV medication. You're looking at four to 10 hours half-life of two, but that bioavailability is up at 70%. So keep these in mind as you're thinking about how to dose things for your patients. So let's talk a little bit about safety and side effects. Um, respiratory depression, whenever we're talking about any, um, any um, opiate medication, that's something of concern. Again, as we had touched on, there's a ceiling effect with respiratory depression. Um, so it's one of the safest opioids in that regard. So if somebody's used to taking the medication and they accidentally overdose, um, they're not necessarily going to go into respiratory failure. Um, it's thought to be related to the norbuprenorphine itself. Um, and interestingly, how they studied this was um, a buprenorphine injection itself to rats that had a lethal dose of norbuprenorphine actually reversed that, that respiratory depression. So, um, by, by overwhelming the receptors with um, the parent drug, um, they were able to reverse that respiratory depression. Um, when compared to fentanyl, we're looking at a 13 and a half fold safety window. So much safer medication than some of these other medications that we're used to dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, QT prolongation is um, not really um, a, a thing that we need to be worried about. When we look at methadone, I know that's been a conversation on our team quite a bit in the last couple of months. Um, we're looking at a, a risk of 29%, um, but a lot of that is when those doses are over 120 milligrams. So something to be concerned about with methadone, but we're not really seeing it with buprenorphine. Um, cardiac death is from torsades is four times more likely with methadone than buprenorphine. So, and, and we typically think of methadone as a relatively safe drug ourselves. So um, if you've got some cardiac issues that you're concerned about, this may be another good one to consider using. Um, again, liver and kidney, because um, this can be excreted through bile, um, unmetabolized, it's safe in renal failure, and it's relatively safe in liver failure for that same reason. It's, it, it can be excreted um, non-metabolized. So for that reason, if, somebody's have, if somebody has bad liver, bad kidney, um, consider this medication. You don't have to change the doses. Um, in the older population, um, looking at patients over 65, um, the pharmacokinetics did not actually change. So uh, taking age into consideration, you may not need to make much adjustment in the dosage. Um, compared to other opioids, um, increased half-life of drug and metabolites is typically seen, uh, but we're not seeing this here. So if you get a patient to a good steady state, they could be on it for years and decades and, and do okay. Um, again, because of the fewer drug-drug interactions, um, this may be a safer medication to use in that, um, in that setting of uh, polypharmacy as well. Um, when it comes to abuse or withdrawal, um, we're, we're looking okay as well. Because of that ORL1 receptor, we see that reduced reward response. Um, we see reduced dependence um, because it does actually displace or block um, other mu agonists like morphine. Um, we, we see less dependence. Um, you can experience withdrawal, it takes about three to five days, and that just has more to do with the half-life of the medication itself. So if somebody's coming off of it, please make sure that you're tapering them slowly um, so they don't go through the withdrawal experience. Uh, there's a low risk of tolerance, um, and I'll show you a graph here in just a minute, but because it's a slower onset than morphine or fentanyl, um, we don't get that reward response we don't see that um, patients build up that tolerance. So looking at this graph, this actually is looking at cancer patients 
um, who through a three month study were given um, either fentanyl, or here's cancer patients here, non-cancer patients here, given fentanyl or buprenorphine and over a three month period of time, looked at that mean increase in dose um, over that three month period. So for cancer and non-cancer patients, you can see that mean increase was about 42.7%, uh, 32 here compared to 21 and 14 for buprenorphine. So there was some dose increase. Some of that may be just adjusting to figure out what the dose is going to need to be for that patient, but considerably less increases over time when looking at um, fentanyl and possibly other um, opiate medications. So rule of thumb is once you get to a steady state and patients are doing pretty well, chances are that you're not gonna have to make too many adjustments to it. Um, real quickly, looking at the GI system, if you have somebody with pancreatitis or pancreatic issues, um, this may be a good one to, just, to consider because there are no sphincter of OD spasms. So um, just one other consideration for which patient should I be using this for. And again, lower incidence of constipation. So low chance of constipation may be good in pancreatitis. Cognitively speaking, um, patients in one study actually showed better visual, psychomotor, and cognitive function compared to patients on morphine, methadone, or fentanyl. So comparing buprenorphine and these three other opiate medications, patients were doing better overall cognitively. Um, and actually, they found that cognition was comparable to placebo. Um, so again, there may be some adjustment period as patients are getting used to an opiate medication, but um, consider that for patients where you're more concerned about cognitive function. As far as other, um, other data goes, um, this study is a couple of years old now, but they looked at post-marketing for 13,000 patients. Nausea was at about 4%, dizziness at 1.5, and tiredness less than 1%. So um, it, it's got an excellent side effect profile in that sense. Um, and a lot of that is thought to be due more to that kappa antagonism again. So. Um, the, the, it, the beauty of this drug. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm a walking advertisement for this, but there's just so much that goes, that goes into it um, that it, it's just such a beautiful medication. Um, where I, I find the most difficulty is with insurance coverage and then dosing itself. So let's talk about dosing. Um, but before we get to dosing, we have the indications. Um, there really are a lot of different pain indications that you can be using this for. Um, somatic pain, neuropathic pain, um, again, opioid abuse. This is something um, that I won't touch on too much in this lecture. Um, and just recently in the state of Michigan, uh, you no longer need the X license to be able to prescribe this for abuse. But um, traditionally, from a palliative care perspective, we've been using it more for that analgesic. So. Um, central pain syndrome um, is one great example of um, when we're using it, um, kind of more of that neuropathic pain. So this is just a brief neuro aside, um, typically an insult to the thalamus. Um, stroke is a usually a common cause, but you can also see it in the brainstem, spinal cord, or even the parietal lobe. So there's my nice um, X over the VPL um, nucleus in the thalamus. Um, this can cause a lot of hyperalgesia, um, especially with temperature, allodynia, and traditionally has been thought to be refractory to opiate therapy and doesn't respond very well to a lot of our other um, neuropathic agents like gabapentin, Lyrica, uh, those sort of things. Um, one study showed a 40% response um, to central pain with buprenorphine. Another um, cancer study, looking at three patients with cancer, they responded well as well to radiculopathies. Um, and a lot of it, um, when you look at the doses in this transdermal study, they started at 35 micrograms um, and went up to 140. You'll see in a minute that these are doses that are done more in Europe. Um, our transdermal patches only go to 20 per, or 20 micrograms here in the United States. Um, but their, their pain scale dropped from eight to 10 down to three to five um, and reported their pain as satisfactory. 
Um, just looking at one case study demonstrating this neuropathic pain. Um, this was for a patient who had um, entered hospice. Um, the transdermal buprenorphine is the TB, um, and then the MF uh, was, was the morphine, um, just for some clarification there. Um, these are the pain, this is the pain scale here. This is time over weeks, um, actually by date. Pain started pretty high. Transdermal buprenorphine was started um, and titrated up to 52. Pain dropped, but you can see kind of some fluctuating um, adjustments with morphine as we go along. Um, we need, uh, we can see the transdermal went up, morphine went up um, as that pain progressed through the, through the diagnosis for this patient. And we could actually titrate um, to, to, we could adjust to the patient's needs um, based on both the, the buprenorphine and the morphine itself. And we're, they were able to keep things quite stable and steady. Uh, you see a peak here, some pain crisis, but we got that, they, I should say, this is not my patient, but they got that transdermal up to 140, morphine was still 60 to 100 daily. Um, so again, using in conjunction, they were able to use both of these medications and keep that pain to a relatively good level for quite some time. So um, that was over a six month period of time. So as pain progresses, you may see that you need to make adjustments as well. Um, where I find it very interesting is that opioid induced, induced hyperalgesia responds um, pretty well to this. Um, or I, I should say is, is less likely of, an, of a problem here. It's the pure opiate agonist or the mu agonist that induced that hyperalgesia, um, but buf buprenorphine is um, less likely to cause it. Um, again, it's that mechanism, that OR, ORL1 receptor and agonism. So we're less likely to see that hyperalgesia. Um, but when we do see hyperalgesia, um, it can do well to help prevent or stop the pain. Uh, so in one study, um, healthy volunteers were electrically stimulated and then given either IV buprenorphine and a placebo versus sublingual buprenorphine and a saline IV or a placebo pill and a saline IV. And what they found is that um, the patients who received the buprenorphine actually had higher anti-hyperalgesic effects than analgesic effects. So it's actually cutting down on that hyperalgesia. So that hypersensitivity, sensitivity to touch, sensitivity to temperature. Uh, when your patients are talking about the bed sheets that are rubbing against their legs and it's just absolutely painful, buprenorphine is good at cutting down on that hyperalgesia and maybe even better than, or a stronger response than that analgesic effect. Um, so when we look closer at this, um, we see um, a comparison of buprenorphine to fentanyl, um, esketamine as well, a fentanyl, really comparing how well these medications um, affect analgesia or provide that pain relief versus an anti-hyperalgesia where it's cutting down on that hypersensitivity um, to sens sensation and touch. Um, and you can see that buprenorphine does have some of that analgesic effect, but there's a much stronger anti-hyperalgesic effect, almost up there with esketamine as well. Um, so think of buprenorphine when you're thinking of anybody with neuropathic pain, this may be a good way to get that under control. Um, again, um, there may be a clinical role for um, central sensitization and might just cut down on some of that central sensitization which allows for this, this anti-hyperalgesic effect. Um, just to highlight it one more time, the dose response curve. Um, so again, we got, this is actually serum concentrations of the buprenorphine versus the percent effect. Um, to highlight that, to get that 50% effect, serum concentrations of pain are about, or buprenorphine to control pain are about at 0.3, but they're at about 0.2 for that hyperalgesia. So keep that in mind when you are seeing those patients with um, neuropathic pain, hyperalgesia, central pain. Um, you may be able, a little bit of morphine or buprenorphine can go a long way. Um, there are some studies that it works well in chronic somatic pain as well. 
Um, one study showed that patients reported good to very good pain relief, um, while 48% also reported good improved quality of sleep. Um, other studies show that pain relief is equal or slightly better to morphine, fentanyl, and even methadone. So um, this study in particular showed that it was more efficacious than morphine um, when pain is more chronic, or um, I know the definition of chronic pain is three months, but when we have long lasting pain going out past a month, um, buprenorphine may help more than some of our typical medications we go to. Um, again, we talked about the potency and the high affinity rate for the receptors. It's 33 times more potent um, than morphine and it's um, 50 and it's got that 50 times higher affinity. So it's going to knock morphine right off of those receptors when, when dosed with morphine. Um, so looking at more of the acute pain in this meta-analysis, there was a slower onset to get pain under control, but was just as effective at that one hour mark. Um, but, and then buprenorphine itself, did trend towards better analgesia, but there was not um, not much significance or clinically clinical significance or statistical significance in that. Um, so that being said, in the acute setting, um, buprenorphine could be considered. Morphine might be able to get the pain under control um, if you need something absolutely right now, but overall quite comparable to morphine in the acute setting. Um, when it comes to sedation, um, there's no significant difference. Um, and I know we, we always talk about a lot about, is it really sedation or is it that the patient's pain is finally under control and they're actually able to fall asleep? So looking at all these different studies, um, they're able to show, um, let's see. I do apologize for this. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the right information. Um, we do know that um, because we're, we're looking at the buprenorphine on this side, morphine on this side, um, with comparing all the studies, um, we are not, not, or we are crossing that center line. So statistically, there's not much significance in these adverse effects here. So just keep that in mind from a safety profile. Um, again, with respiratory depression, um, there's no significant um, difference. Um, theoretically, we've got no ceiling effect, uh, but monitor closely um, for that res respiratory compromise again as well especially if somebody is more opiate naive, there may be more of a chance of something occurring. If somebody is more used to opiate medications, there's a lot less likely chance of it, of it happening. Uh, again, this is just a review of that ceiling effect. Um, so I do wanna show just in comparison, um, uh, the dosing conversion table. So um, up here, these are the daily morphine equivalents um, going from 12 up to 300. And then we compare transdermal to buccal and sublingual tabs. Note that with the sublingual tabs, they don't start until the morphine equivalent is about 80. So one milligram, which is half of a two milligram tab, which is as low as it comes, is about equal to 80 morphine equivalents in a day. So you don't want to start somebody on a one milligram tab if they're opiate naive, because that's going to knock them out and they're not going to do well. Um, those tabs go pretty high, two milligrams three times a day, six milligrams total in a day is about 300 morphine equivalents. So sublingual, they're dirt cheap, easy for insurance to cover, but you really have to be at high, high morphine or morphine equivalent doses to really have this one be effective. On the opposite end of that, um, in the United States, we have the transdermal patches, which start at five micrograms an hour and go up to 20 micrograms an hour. Um, and as I alluded to in the other slides, in Europe, they're starting at 35 micrograms and going up into the 140s. So that's not available to us here. So when you reach 20 micrograms, you're really looking at about that 48 to 60 uh, morphine equivalent mark. Um, 
I've had maybe one patient where I've put two patches on, and that is something that you could consider. Um, but in reality and practicality for most patients, um, we really lose what we can do with the patches once we hit that 60 milligram mark um, or that 20 microgram for comparison. Um, and that's why I really, my favorite is this buccal patch. Um, again, it's very tough to get insurance to cover. Sometimes actually Medicaid will cover it, uh, but you can cut the patch in half. So you can take this 75 microgram patch, cut it in half, and you're looking at six morphine equivalents um, in a day. So you can get very low um, with that patch, and then you can get up um, to that 450 micrograms every 12 hours. So you get, you get the whole range and there's a lot of flexibility in how you dose it. Um, I do have some patients who are on 450 three times a day and tolerating it quite well. So when I can, this is where I like to go. Um, if pain's milder, think transdermal patch. If pain is quite strong and they're used to um, opiate medications, um, sublingual tabs may be something that you could consider doing. Um, so again, this is more of the data itself. Um, IM or IV is going to be more potent. You dose that, or I mean more, more rapidly affected. Um, you dose it at 0.3 to 0.6 milligrams. And the nice thing is you get a six hour effect. Again, we're not doing IV very often, but it is an option for you. Sublingual, um, it comes in two and eight milligram tablets. Um, again, that two milligram, you can cut in half. Eight milligrams, you can cut in half. Um, the tabs do tend to crumble quite easily. So I have patients tell me that if they break it in half, they can use one half of it and the other just kind of sits there as a pile of powder. So um, not always the best way of doing it, but you can do it. Um, takes about 10 minutes, you put it under the tongue, it dissolves. It's recommended to be used more for breakthrough pain, um, more so because it's, a, it's cumbersome to do this three times a day, have that sit under your tongue um, and let it dissolve. There is a risk of oral ulcers from doing this, um, but it is something that in practice, um, I've done it with a few patients where they are, were on it more regularly. And it was usually because we were using much higher doses um, than that, that buccal film could allow us to do. The transdermal patch, again, um, goes up to 20, but you can start at five and it goes in increments of about two and a half to five. Um, Europe, it starts much higher. Um, again, it's a seven day patch. So unlike fentanyl, which is three, this fits much more nicely in that, that calendar. Uh, you can start it on Monday and keep it going until next Monday and then switch it out easier for compliance and to make it a, a weekly routine. Um, unlike fentanyl, it, there's no depot. It actually just diffuses directly into the circulation. So you don't have to worry about lasting effects once the patch is removed. Um, there Again, beauty of any patch is there's no peak and trough effect. Um, buccal films, um, we can do, again, it says seven, 750 to 900 milligrams. United States, we got the, the film up to 450 micrograms. Again, you can cut it in half, which is a, the beauty uh, of it. It can really help in dosing. Again, I'm doing some TID, TID dosing, but you should be able to get away with BID. Um, higher doses QT prolongation again once you're hitting that 900 mark. So be careful with that. Um, just watch EKGs as you go along. Um, just in the last year and a half, maybe two years, there's been some new evidence as well that um, these are causing more um, dental caries, cavities. So make sure that after the patient um, use, does the film, you stick it on the side of the, the mouth. It dissolves over about 15 to 20 minutes. Good to swish and swish and swallow, uh, just to get any re residual residue off. So, um, so we don't develop um, tooth decay. Um, starting dose again um, on that transdermal patch. Um, studies recommend 35 micrograms, which is a pretty high dose. Um, you could. Um, you can start at five, 10, that's clinically kind of 
in the range that I've been more comfortable doing is, um, especially if somebody's opiate naive, see how they do on that five or 10 first, and you can bump it up from there. Uh, buccal films, again, if you're starting somebody out brand new, 75 is a great place to start. Um, sublingual, again, that one milligrams equals 80 oral morphine equivalents. So use that only if somebody's been more um, opiate tolerant. Um, again, no ceiling effect on the analgesia. Um, so sometimes even IV dosing, there have been cases reported as high as seven milligrams IV. Um, so just know that if the pain's not under control, there is room to move. And just like some of these other severe opiate or pain crises, we might see people on 400 milligrams of morphine or, or something that seems, um, seems crazy or insane. But Sometimes titration slowly over time, and we see we need to get used more and more, that that is something that we can do. So know that there's no ceiling effect on that analgesia. Um, so here is, let's see. This is something that everybody is going to run into on the floors. If you haven't already, it's going to come up. Um, the surgeon's gonna call you and they're gonna say, we've got this patient on buprenorphine. They're going in for surgery. We need, we need help figuring out pain control. Um, what do we need to do? Um, does the patient stay on the buprenorphine? Do we stop it because it's an antagonist? Um, how, how should we handle this? Um, a lot of people recommend removing the patch um, due to those antagonist effects, but is there really any reason for doing this? Um, the short answer really is no. Um, just remember that that antagonism, there's no antagonism um, in combination with those mu agonists. It antagonizes the kappa receptor. So it's an agonist on the mu receptors where we get the analgesic effect. Um, it may push some of those re, um, mu agonists off the receptors they're bound to, but again, there's plenty of receptors left over as reserve. So um, you're, you're more than safe to use buprenorphine and pure um, opiate agonists as you need to um, in the acute setting of, of surgery. Uh, so there's a few ways to approach it. Um, I'm gonna talk about four different ways. The first way is just continue everything you're doing. So don't change the maintenance dose, titrate short acting medications. You might need some higher doses to get um, better effect. Um, if, if you're going to do this and for whatever reason, buprenorphine needs to be stopped, use caution because there's going to be increased sensitivity to that full opiate agonist. So you may see sedation and respiratory depression as that buprenorphine comes off. Um, this tends to be the simplest way and typically what I'm recommending for most patients is continue everything as is and adjust those um, short actings. Another way that has been studied is to deliver the same total daily dose over a six to eight hour period of time. So take that dose they may be on, split up the doses. Um, patients, again, will probably need some more um, short acting analgesics with it. Um, so just an example here, somebody's on 32 milligrams, uh, possibly for addiction at this point. You could give it as eight milligrams every six hours, break it up, it's gonna give more of an analgesic effect and then add the short actings on top of it. Uh, third option is to discontinue. Start the rapid titration um, of a long and short acting opiate agonist to avoid withdrawal, um, titrate to analgesic effect, and, and pull off that buprenorphine. So this, in, in this sense, you need to be acting proactively upstream, get them off the buprenorphine before going in for surgery, keep them on the pure opiate agonist, the mu agonist through surgery, and then consider weaning off of that and putting them back on their buprenorphine. Uh, gets to be a little bit more complicated. Um, surgeons may like it because it seems less complicated if they're just on one medication and not on the buprenorphine. But uh, again, um, this is more time consuming and I think there's more risk for error overall. I think it may be better just to keep that buprenorphine going throughout surgery. Um, others may recommend converting, change that buprenorphine to methadone. Um, you could think about 30 to 40 milligrams daily 
Um, it really just depends on what your buprenorphine dose actually is. So methadone binds less tight, tightly to the mu, to mu receptors. Um, the opiate response is going to be a little more predictable in that sense. So um, as you, and again, just keep in mind, as you reintroduce the buprenorphine, um, you might precipitate opiate withdrawal as, as that buprenorphine comes on board. So again, option number one, keeping things the same and titrating short acting may be the simplest thing and the best thing for your patients. Um, so again, um, just to, to emphasize it one more time, adding opiates to patients on buprenorphine is safe and effective. Um, buprenorphine occupies fewer of those receptors. And also, again, as we talked about it, it increases the ex expression of the receptors. Uh, but do use caution. You can see an additive effect with morphine and tramadol, um, and even more so with um, hydromorphone, dilaudid, or oxycodone. So you can do it. Uh, use caution as you're doing it, though. Um, again, there's even recommendations that you can use opiates for breakthrough pain in cancer patients uh, who are on transdermal patches. So as much as you may hear myth or things otherwise, you can easily use both in combination with caution. Um, and finally, um, approved brands, products in the United States, Butrans is the brand name of the buprenorphine um, patch. Um, that is now actually generic as of probably five, six years ago. Copays are still pretty expensive on that one. Um, Buprenex is the IV medication, um, not used very often. Um, Subutex is brand name for that sublingual. Um, it's actually been generic since 2009, so there is no brand name Subutex, um, but you may still use that term. Um, and then anything here, um, Suboxone, Zubzolf, um, Temgesic, uh, Boonaville, these are all um, buprenorphine naloxone combinations used much more in, um, in addiction medicine. Um, you may run into it, know that the buprenorphine is still going to have that analgesic effect, even if they're using suboxone. But we in palliative medicine are typically not prescribing suboxone. Um, but it is a consideration. So if you've got a patient on hospice, um, who you're still concerned that um, opiate abuse is, is an issue, um, you may want to consider it. Um, a little bit easier to prescribe now, um, now that we don't require that X waiver, but um, even if you're using it for pain and you're doing a combination drug, that has always historically been acceptable from that DEA perspective. So with that, these are costs. Um, sublingual eight milligram tablets, about $53. Buccal films, um, 368, um, usually covered. Insurance will do a good job covering most of that cost. And then transdermal patches, about $200. Um, some co-pays may be in the $100, 100 plus range. So keep that in mind. So um, the ways I like to administer it tend to be the ones that are much more expensive. Um, and again, these are a couple of years old, but um, gives you a good ballpark. So in summary, um, it's long-acting, semi-synthetic, um, usually using it sublingual, buccal, or transdermal. It's great for neuropathic and somatic pain, and it has a strong um, antihyperalgesic effect. So um, pure opiate agonist, feel free to use it. It is appropriate to use those for breakthrough pain. Um, it's safe in liver and kidney failure and may be safer than traditional opiates. Um, Again, there's that theoretical ceiling effect in respiratory depression, and there's a uh, little chance at, at the normal doses, no QTC prolongation. At the higher doses, we run into more of a chance of that. So um, with that, I will stop sharing and we can open things up for questions. Hi, Joel, Todd Wynn, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, Todd, good to see you. Good. Good to see you. I, I definitely appreciate your lecture. As, as always, I feel like I'm underutilizing this medication, um, although I seem to be slowly increasing my use of it uh, over time. And I'm sure uh, probably today I'll, I'll, I'll use a little more of it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I had, I had uh, some different questions. 
My first question was how to choose between using the transdermal patch, the sublingual tablet, or the uh, transmucosal film. I, I think the answer is is based mainly on on dosing, and and maybe somewhat on cost. But is there is there another situation in which you are there other factors that you use to consider how you're going to choose between those those three? Um, I'd, I'd say dosing is number one. What is the dose that I need to get somebody to? Um, if if I'm thinking it's a a, a small um, kind of a milder neuropathic pain, that transdermal patch is going to be nice and easy. Um, I mean, compliant. I, I hate using the word compliance, but developing that habit of dosing is is easier when you're doing it once a week. Um, people don't like to be taking things multiple times a day. Um, but when we're getting up into those higher doses, um, I'm really leaning uh, more on the that buccal film first of all. Um, more so, again, um, it's easier to do that than stick something under your tongue. Um, more of a convenience factor that way, and you can. Um, do that more easily three times a day than you can do the sublingual tab. So I'll usually put in, write the order, talk to pharmacy, see what's going to work. But ultimately, insurance really dictates uh, where I end up going um, with this most of the time. Um, so I'll have an idea of where I want to go, but I'll tell the patient often, this is where we're going to start, but insurance might make us switch to this other medication or other, other form. Okay. Well, thank you. I had one one other question, if uh, if that's okay. Which is, uh, are, are you are you utilizing buprenorphine as a first line long acting medication? So, uh, rather than choosing an MSER or an oxy ER or a fentanyl patch, are you are you uh, on occasion going directly to buprenorphine as your long acting? Um, in in my line of work, I'll go to those much quicker, uh, more because I'm seeing that neuropathic pain as that component. Um, okay. So in all reality, by the time patients have seen me, gabapentin's failed, Lyrica's failed, they've been on their second tricyclic antidepressant. Um, so then I'm looking, looking at either a buprenorphine, a methadone, or um, compounding ketamine. Um, so for me personally, it comes down to, do I start methadone? Do I start buprenorphine? Um, honestly, methadone wins out quite a bit just because of the ease of administration again, um, cost of the medication. But um, I'd say that if I'm looking at somatic pain, I'd probably still start with a morphine oxycodone first, um, more so because of its uh, dosing profile. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. All right. Any other questions? Well, actually, yes. So if nobody else <laughs> is going to have one, okay. I, I just said. Uh... So, so, and I, I do appreciate your your clarity that this is this is a discussion about buprenorphine rather than suboxone. Mm -hmm. um, I am uh, on occasion now seeing more patients coming into the hospital on suboxone, not necessarily for opioid use disorder, but for chronic pain or for some some blending of the two. But mm -hmm. where it's being prescribed, maybe by their primary care physician, they're on suboxone, not just the buprenorphine, but the suboxone with the naltrexone in it. Mm -hmm. And they're coming into the hospital with that. And mm -hmm. then I'm being asked to see them to help help manage pain. And uh, I guess that that is an area that has been a little bit more confusing for me because of the addition of the naltrexone, I do think is is somewhat complicating. I, and I guess there's some, I, I would look to you for a little advice here. Is this is this one where you tend to trans, transition just to plain buprenorphine? Do you tend to uh, just leave it alone and, and add additional traditional opiates uh, to that, knowing you're going to have to overcome some of the naltrexone pieces there? Do you go up on the on the on the suboxone? Uh, that's what? A, that, that's a great yeah. question, and it, and it really comes down to how does suboxone work? Um, so when you're looking at suboxone, it's, it's that combination, but what is that naloxone really doing? Um, suboxone is intended to be taken sublingual, um, which means that the bioavailability of the naloxone is near zero. It's not getting absorbed into the system at, at, at all when you're using it appropriately. So in, in that regard, using your other um, opiates, however you want, you could, in theory, think of suboxone just like a regular buprenorphine tablet. Uh, the, the naloxone itself really becomes an issue if, if you crush the tab, inject it, that's when we're starting to get the 
the the antagonistic effects of the, that naloxone. So okay. the anti-abuse portion of that is really to make sure patients are using the medication in the appropriate manner. So I pharmacologically see. speaking, it, it really shouldn't affect what we're doing from an opiate standpoint. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. All right. So Again, um, if questions come up or as you guys start dosing uh, buprenorphine, usually for about the next month or two after I give this lecture, I'm getting a lot of phone calls and I'm happy to answer those questions. <laughs> um, it's, it's a great drug and um, I continue to use it on a, a quite uh, regular basis and love what I can do for the right patient. I just had a question. Uh, do you... How often are your patients, are you on just the buprenorphine film versus having those ad, uh, PRN short-acting opioids with it, let's say? Um, I'd say I see more people on just the buprenorphine. Again, it may be my patient population where we're dealing more with the, with the neuropathic pain, the central pain, um, where opiates, mu agonists are not going to be as effective. Um, clinically on the inpatient side, I do see that we are using the buprenorphine along with the opiates uh, on a fair occasion, especially, again, mostly with those post-operative patients, I say that we're seeing that uh, more often. But if we're looking at a general outpatient sort of setting, I'm not, I don't typically see a lot of people on both of those. Usually you can titrate the buprenorphine to a high enough uh, level to control both that neuropathic and somatic pain.